I would love to just start with a little bit about who is Charles Eisenstein and what's what's the kind of theme that defines your work. The easiest way to describe what I do is I'm a speaker and a writer. The overarching theme of all of my work is the transition in the defining stories of our civilization, the mythology of our civilization. In a nutshell, it's a transition from a story of separation that holds me separate from you, human separate from nature, body separate from mind, flesh separate from spirit, uh, to a story of interconnection, interdependency, interbeing, where these separations are healed, not just on a conceptual level, but also on a relational level, a systemic level. So it affects politics, it affects money, it affects technology, medicine, education, like pretty much every realm of human activity is subject to this massive shift that is underway right now and that we are here to serve and to see to its fruition. Yeah, this idea of stories and mythologies is one that I deeply relate to. You know, Earthrise, we our sort of tagline is telling stories for a new world. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big believer that, you know, stories are are the, the reason we are where we are today. I mean, our world is made up of stories. And I always remember reading Yuval Noah Harari's book, Sapiens, in which he talks about, you know, corporations are just a story that we tell. Money is a story, right? Like the way we live is just a product of, of, of the stories and mythologies that we tell. And, and, you know, as we're all coming to realize, there's some pretty flawed ideologies in there. You know, Harari is a good example. I mean, he recognizes the power of story, yet he himself is immersed in stories that he's not aware of, that he's not conscious of. One of those stories, which is almost universal in our society, is the story of progress that essentially says we started out as these helpless, naked animals. And thanks to our minds, we developed science, we developed technology, we progressed from ignorance and superstition to true verifiable knowledge. We progressed from helplessness to technological mastery and that our continued evolution and our destiny and our improvement and our happiness is a matter of extending this kind of control over the world outside of ourselves to new degrees to new realms, to control human activity through surveillance and to control the, the workings of the body through nanotechnology and genetic engineering and to engineer a perfect society. Like that whole arc of progress is itself a mythology in a very clear sense. Where do we come from? Where are we going? What's good? What's bad? It's a war against chaos. It's a conquest of nature. It's a core, one of the key elements of the story of separation. Because if you're separate from the world and there's no intelligence outside of the human intelligence, then of course our betterment comes through imposing intelligence onto a world that has none. Like that concept of progress is inherent to the story of separation. But it's obviously not working very well anymore. We're not living in the utopia that every futurist predicted with confidence in the 1960s. Instead, things are getting worse. And despite the miracles that technology is able to achieve, the human condition is deteriorating. Chronic diseases afflict in my country something like 65% of all people. It used to be like 4% in 1950. And that's just one example. I mean, the whole thing's falling apart. And that suggests to many of us the need for, you know, not just some improvements. Maybe if we get everything into a data set and the internet of things, then finally we will achieve this triumph but that we want to start on a completely different arc and enter into a different kind of technology and a different way of relating to each other and the world that understands that what we do to the world, we ultimately do to ourselves, that what we do to another, we do to ourselves. That's what interbeing is. Mm -hmm. I am not separate from the world. If we destroy the rainforest, then we destroy maybe not ourselves as existing beings, but something in us dies. Anytime a species goes extinct, something in us dies. Every time a place is turned into a parking lot, something in us dies. And we see the results in a decline in our well-being. Even if by the things that we measure, it's fine. GDP is up, productivity, consumption, the average size of a house is twice what it was in 1960. I mean, things are getting better and better, right? But no. I just read that 50 million prescriptions for Adderall are written in the United States every year. That's like a sixth of the population. And that's just Adderall. That doesn't include SSRIs and other psychiatric drugs. This is a, a gigantic sick house. And so the need for a new story is undeniable at this point.
And of course, then there's the ecological crisis. This is not the world we want to live in that's continuing to die. Even if we could survive in a dead world, in a concrete world, where the only nature left is on screens, depictions, recordings of old bird songs. I mean, can you imagine? But a lot of people are retreating into that world already. That's like the inevitable culmination of the story of separation, to be so separate that you're not even in materiality. You're always in the virtual world. And so we're like, no, enough. That's not the world we want to live in. And we're going to choose something different. And this is the story that will carry us to a different world. It goes all the way to the bottom. The story of who am I? What is a person? Why are we here? What's the purpose of a human being and of the human species? Those are the questions we have to ask and revolutionize. Because that old story, the purpose of the human species is to conquer and to dominate. That doesn't excite me very much. Mm -hmm. You know? Why are we here to participate and serve the unfolding of life and beauty on Earth and in the cosmos? So much is coming up for me when you're speaking. It's like almost hard to organize my thoughts. But one of the things that's standing out is this link you're drawing between, yeah, the sort of state of human health. And actually, you talked about that before even coming on to planetary health. And I think for so long, we've justified the way we treat the environment by means of like human progress. It's like, okay, yeah, the environment might be suffering, but, you know, people are doing better, right? Like we're progressing as a society. I feel like in a way I was kind of the last generation probably to grow up with that sense of idealism of like, hey, things are going to be better in the future. You know, we're like we're marching forward. I think generations born now just don't have that as 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 a story or a guarantee anymore. And that's that's what's fundamentally changed. But it's this question of like, who is this working for? Do you know? I mean, like if it's not working for the planet and it's not working for us as well. So like, who is it working for? Why are we, why are we upholding these systems? So it needs like yeah. a redefining, you know, it's like, it's redefining, yeah. redefining that story. And, and I guess, you know, that's like, it feels like we're in this time where we're searching, right? For a new collective story. I, I don't know if you feel that. You know, I think we're entering what I call the space between stories where the old systems and structures of sense and meaning are collapsing. Often it is through a health crisis that somebody has, but now we're seeing economic breakdown, ecological breakdown. Things just don't make sense anymore, and people don't know what to think. Mm. And that's vertiginous feeling of bewilderment, which leaves people very vulnerable to fundamentalism, to Mm. cults, to extreme political ideologies, because those replace the old story with something new. It It becomes a political story that gives you meaning and identity again. But ultimately, those will betray people as well. And they'll really enter into the place of, I just don't know. I call it the fertile ground of bewilderment. That's <laughs> that's the emptiness into which authentically new story can come. And I think we're kind of entering that stage. Popularity of fundamentalism. I mean, in every religion, Hindu fundamentalism, Christian fundamentalism, Jewish fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism. All of these are are rapidly expanding at the expense of the old mainline churches, for example. But also various types of political fundamentalism. You know, it could be race fundamentalism, gender fundamentalism, it could be like white supremacy, you know, like these racist ideologies. I mean, even in environmentalism, there is also climate fundamentalism, carbon sure. fundamentalism that blames everything on one thing. Here's the enemy, it's carbon dioxide, and if we only could reduce carbon dioxide, all of our environmental problems would be solved. Right. I mean, I spent a whole book explaining why that is not true. And just as with other forms of fundamentalism, terrible damage is done in the name of reducing carbon, you know, like a vast expansion of mining all over the world. This fundamentalism is, people are very vulnerable to it when their older structures of sense and meaning have collapsed and they don't know who they are. But in a way, like the popularity of cults, conspiracy theories, fundamentalism, and so forth, bespeaks this stage of the process of entering into the space between stories. So I think it's, you know, in a way, a hopeful sign. Yeah, and and, and there's there's a comfort for things that make sense out of the world at a time of great disorder, right? Right. The transition from an old story to a new story accompanies a transition on the psychological level and on the body level too. Yeah, it requires this sort of radical imagination, openness. It requires us to get outside of our sort of echo chamber and the way we're conditioned to see the world and consider other perspectives. And as you've sort of suggested, that can lead people down all sorts of rabbit holes. But in a way, that's actually just the first step towards like, you know, trying to understand a different um, perspective. I really love this idea of fertile bewilderment you know you sort of use that term to describe where we're at at the moment what are the stories that you think are sort of um 
up and coming that you that you think are worth like bringing it to the forefront? So I can start with indigenous wisdom. It's important not to fetishize indigenous people. From my experience with them, all of the ills of our society exist in some form in their societies. Us versus them thinking, groupthink, vengeance, gossip. They in some societies had and still have social mechanisms to handle the Mm. conflicts that arise from those, you know, and to perpetuate the society and keep it in balance. But it's not like they are absent. That said, indigenous societies have operated in a different story. They have, on the margins of civilization, preserved other mythologies. The essence of these, it's not so much in the specific stories that they tell about the origin of the world. Every place-based culture has a different story of the origin of the world that refers to the local features of the environment and the animals and plants that are there. So a new story does not mean that we import the stories of indigenous people and the specific myths of indigenous people and remove them from their context, remove Mm. them from their place. Once you've removed it from its place, it's no longer the same story. But underneath those stories, there is actually a unifying alternate mythology. There are common themes across pretty much every indigenous culture. One of the most important ones is that human beings are not alone here. We're not the only significant, conscious, sentient, intelligent, and valuable beings, but we are companioned by many other kingdoms, peoples, the plant people, the animal people, the wind, the clouds, everything is a being in most belief systems outside our own. So that is something that we can learn from. Mm. And another one would be that change in the world happens not only through force-based causality, but there is an intelligence in all things that Mm. manifests as purposeful behavior that is not caused by a force, but it just happens. The world is alive. Uh, That one's a bit more subtle, but it's also pretty universal. So I think that as we seek out a new mythology for civilization, you know, it's not like we all of a sudden adopt the world is made by spider woman or the world rests on the back of a turtle. You know, people can tell those stories. They might point us in a new direction, but whatever the next story is for us, it can't repudiate where we have come to. It cannot repudiate science, but rather maybe reframe it, put it in a place within a larger story. To me, it feels like sort of a reframing, but also just an expansion of knowledge. Like it feels like we're only just starting to appreciate the intelligence that's within nature. You know, like like how do trees talk to each other? What are these mycelium networks under the ground? with it's just like a an enhancement of our understanding of these things that we've kind of just written off as sort of non-human objects and therefore not intelligent the new story that we're entering into has ancient roots you know what makes somebody indigenous what makes somebody indigenous is to be truly of a place it's not in your blood it's not in your genes that make you indigenous it's to be truly of a place to have relationships to that place to have stories about that place to be intimate with it. And if you are in connection through technology and money only to distant places and distant people, and you don't know the names of the trees outside and their medicinal uses, and the name of the person who fell from that tree 30 years ago, then you don't know that place. You're not indigenous. Mm. So the scientific developments you're talking about are actually also moving us back toward indigeneity Mm. because they give us permission to relate to soil, forest, my garden back there as a being. It is no longer scientifically absurd to say soil is alive and conscious. Mm. Like that used to be what would be called spirituality. Right. Yes, you know, the indigenous people believe that and we'll indulge them and, and respect them. But Honestly, we know better. The soil is composed of silicates and carbon, organic molecules, and that's what the soil really is. That's one of the main mythologies of reductionism, that what something really is, is its parts. We are graduating now from that. And so what you mentioned, like the intelligence of mycelial networks, the intelligence of soil that have all the neurotransmitters that a human being has, and even maybe a greater density of connections than in the human brain, and tightly coupled feedback loops and emergent behavior and everything that we associate with intelligence and with life. Soil has that. Ecosystems have that. The ocean has that. It's everywhere. It's everything. We're not alone here. So I think that it is not in the discarding of science and moving into some spiritual unscientific realm that a new story will be found. But it is Mm -hmm. in the expansion of science. I mean, really, you could just call it systems thinking, non-linearity. How do we start to reconnect to the land? How do we reconnect ourselves to nature? And how can the kind of change on a personal level uh, influence our change on like a physical collective level? 
Yeah, it's all about reestablishing relationships. The, the story of separation manifests in every aspect of modern life, even our shoes. The way that shoes were made in the 20th century was all about separation. It's like you will be healthier if you have like all these paddings and supports and like pretty soon you're wearing like these massive running shoes that I ran track and cross country at university. Like, I mean, we're getting injured all the time. That was just like one very specific example of how the story of separation causes illness in ourselves. Like we cannot be healthy in separation from the world because the world is part of ourselves. So even to like go barefoot, it's to reclaim a kind of a connection. It's a very small step. I think much more important though is, but it's in the same vein, is to reconnect with the people around you but it's not so easy like it's there's no simple formula to do that because when everybody around you meets their needs through technology and money yeah i could go and meet my neighbor but what are we going to do for each other when all of our needs are already met you know it feels kind of an artificial well, we can have each other over for dinner but we don't really need to do that but there are actually unmet needs all around us that have intensified in the technological era so really it's about in, to move into the story of interbeing the story of reunion it just starts with an openness and receptivity and will to reconnect and then you become attuned to opportunities to do so and there may be opportunities Opportunities to reconnect with people in a community, maybe opportunities to reconnect with the plants and animals and soil and water around you, and maybe take off your shoes, maybe to have your hands in the in the soil. There, there's many relationships that want to happen that are just waiting for our willingness to do so. In, in raising children, there's a lot of opportunities too. You know, when I was a kid, we would we were all always outside roaming the neighborhood. A lot of kids won't do that now. Even if you push them outside, there's no other kids outside. What fun is there outside when everybody's on their devices? To them, the real world now is the online world. Hmm. And in-person events are sources of images and videos to feed into social media, which is their real world. There is no easy solution here. We are deep, deep in a system that has concretized around the story of separation and that mm. continues to generate that story deep in it ecologically, physically, in our health, in our ways of thinking, in our systems, in our politics. We're deep, deep in it. But we would not be here if there were no way out. If there were no return path, we would not still have hope, which we do. For me, it touches on, I'm just thinking as you're talking like the, you know, the, the all pervasive mythology of, of consumerism, right? Like, you know, I've grown up with the narrative that, that I am not enough. And in order to be more whole, I need to, to buy, like to part with my money, you know, for things, for clothes, for expensive items that are going to make me feel better, make me feel more connected. And I feel like my generation and the generations, you know, beyond me have woken up to the fact that that's just a, a total flaw. Like you can't feel that that void, that hole inside by by buying things. And, you know, I mean, it is a huge question, right? How do you how do you reconnect to the world and how do you create that sense of fulfillment? But like for me, going out into nature, some version of nature, whatever that looks like to you, just an outdoor space and, and being around other people uh, and connecting in a way that is vulnerable felt deeply nourishing to me because it gave me that sense of of purpose and, and deep connection that I think we're, we're all searching for. And, and social media is often like, you know, selling you that and we're all sort of like scrabbling mm -hmm. to try and find it and, and and you never quite get it and that's of course the way those, those social medias are designed i mean there's kind of like a perverse truth in consumerism which is that yes you are not whole you are feeling like an existential hunger mm -hmm. but then what's offered to meet that is something that you buy that doesn't mm -hmm. actually connect you what you're really hungry for is to restore your connections to be whole because you're in relationship and so you, mm. yeah you go on a like a men's workshop or something like that where you get some experience of what you've been yearning for and you recognize it on a soul level and then you, what happens then you go back to your cubicle and you're even more intensely unhappy <laughs> right. for having experienced that that is good to be even more dissatisfied because if you acknowledge and own and feel that dissatisfaction it will orient you to ways to change your environment or to change your circumstances it's like a discomfort isn't it and i think probably that's in some ways what we've kind of lived through in a global level is this kind of global feeling of like discomfort around the the pandemic and for many different reasons right but i think it probably was a time where people were forced to slow down look inwards and kind of sit with themselves and think is this working for me and i think you know we're seeing this kind of global reshifting uh post pandemic so i agree it's like it's a necessary uneasiness that that leads to change one thing we got to experience during the pandemic was where we are going it was like this fast forward preview of separation to its extreme. 
have you seen the Apple TV show Extrapolations? But, um, it's a new show on Apple and it's it's set in a future where the climate crisis is fully realized. I feel I've been waiting for the na the narrative of climate to really drop into the mainstream. Do you, uh, a new climate story? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a, a climate and ecological crisis, and we often miss off the ecological part. Climate is given lots of focus and not the ecological part. This was really illuminated for me reading Jason Hickel's book, uh, Less is More. Uh, um, it's about degrowth. You know, and, you and know the I was there as, as and lots, as lots of those technological solutions you've just suggested, the geoengineering, don't take into account growth, and there is no infinite growth on a finite planet. And so divided like, up into you know, groups it's a fundamental of 20 or 30. floor that we're not really addressing. This series, it does address all of that, it talks so all about ecological three teams, breakdown and biodiversity three, breakdown. Three I was sort of pleasantly like, wow, this is someone who really understands this um, issue with, with nuance. That you're there was a weird catharsis. When I see these things, I'm like, oh, that's kind of cathartic because it's getting through. And then I'm like, oh, it's also terrifying because the climate crisis is now the subject of a huge apple show. And like, we're here, we're in that, that future, you know, already.